Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to episode 49 of the Rugby League Coach podcast. I'm joined, as always, by my good friend, Lee Roy, the daddy, Addison. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, well, it seems like it may just be us to start this podcast off, Lee. Yeah, you know, you know what some of them are like. Chris said he might be late. He said he said this time was better for him. Mm. He's not here yet. Rosie was a late dropout. Tim is just hit and miss at the minute with him, and James has said he can't make it. But that's okay. I mean, we mm. started like this. We can we can work like this, Taylor. No problem. Absolutely, and and I do want to apologise to the regular listeners, the regular viewers. Uh, this there will be a later release date on this podcast this week. I'm putting the hand up right now. That's my fault. Uh, I've been a bit uh, a bit busy with work and have not been able to record earlier in the week. So, thankfully, I have a very flexible partner here in Lee Addison, who was uh, willing to move and shake and uh, cooperate with me. Yeah. Otherwise, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it would be a different different story. It's funny, mate. I had to cancel a coaching appointment tonight just for something that landed on my desk to deal with. So, um, these things happen, don't they, mate? They do. They do happen, and I am uh, I'm extremely grateful for you and the boys for moving things around for me. I, I do appreciate it. Um, I would. I would. I mean, I'd like to ask you a question, mate. I mean, yeah. And we'll also bring this up on your podcast that we that we record in the same sitting. Now, what's that called again? Around the town. It's around the town. With Taylor. Just just trying to get that brand out there. And it's quite it's quite appropriate, isn't it? This week around the town with Taylor Brown, or maybe it should be it called is. around several towns with Taylor Brown. Just tell everybody your journey around Australia this week. Yes. Or, st- or uh, should I say the continent of Australasia? I feel like that's how it's been. On on Monday, uh, Sunday night, I uh, took a plane from Brisbane to Canberra, um, drove to Cooma, the beautiful city of Cooma. It was freezing cold there. Uh, one degrees it was that night. Uh, got up the next morning, headed to the Snowy Mountains uh, for a job at the Snowy Mountains. Um, unexpectedly spent the night in the town of Gundagai, home of the oh. Gundagai Tigers. Um, and the great man James Luff. It's a funny story. I could, couldn't go Did anywhere. Did you see Luffy? I didn't see him. It was unexpected I was there. Um, but a funny story. We ended up having having dinner at the only place open, which was the pub. And uh, the great lady surprise. the lady walked past me and, and there was a memorabilia on the wall. I said, oh, the Gundagai Tigers. She said, how do you know the Gundagai Tigers? I said, oh, I made a mine plays for him. You might not know him. She, she said, oh, who is it? I said, James Luff. She said, oh, yeah, James Luff married to Lucy Luff. They just had another daughter. They He's the most, <laughs> most popular man in the world, James Luff. Sorry, not another daughter, their first daughter. Um, but yes, so then I, I got up the next morning um, to Tumut, then to the Snowy Mountains, then back to Canberra. Um, got there pretty late, but we needed to get to the Central Coast for a meeting the next morning. So we drove straight through to Terrigal, got there at 3 a.m., I'm um, up at 6 for a meeting, full day there, and then back home. So, And how uh, much driving on the road did you do, or did you share the driving duties with someone? We shared the driving duties. We shared the driving duties. So around. you could have so a little snooze in the car if you needed. Yeah, yeah. There were a few little tiny power naps. Um, so, but uh, yeah, that was a, it was a full on couple of days, mate. Very, very full on couple of days. Um, but yeah, that's that's the nature of the beast, I guess. Mm-hmm. But it is what it is. Mm-hmm. Anyway, Lee, I do want to jump in with you. I do have some coaching questions. Now, it's going to be in and around state of origin mm. and in and around a subject that you've you've covered quite extensively. It's, it's a little addition to that. You've been pretty open in your, um, can I say, criticism of the NRL, the, the program they put on NRL players, um, which bangs them up and, and they don't think of player welfare. I think it's been eye-opening the last few weeks to see how many of these origin stars have gone down since game one. Um, it's been a tremendous amount. Do you do you have a quick comment on that before I continue? With I, your question? I don't know if it's purely the NRL. You know, you said I've been critical of the NRL. I don't know if it's necessarily the NRL that is at fault here. I think it's probably the broadcasters mm. because of their mm. desire for content and when they want it. Obviously, the NRL is then um, charged with deciding who plays when. Mm. So there's obviously, you know, certain teams have amount of an amount of five day turnarounds, blah 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 blah. But I do think that we'd, we'd be silly to think that the broadcasters aren't the ones who are saying that we have to play Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday. And then the NRL obviously have a real tough job trying to keep everyone happy, and they're never going to keep everyone happy. So. Yeah, I, I just think we're asking our players to do much and, and, and I'm critical of the NRL clubs, definitely, in terms of the training that they put the players under because I actually think that because of the... It's maybe maybe the, the, fir- the first team to blink 
will probably suffer quite early, but I feel that the training too hard, the game's too hard and fast. Again, that's probably in the NRL's court, but also um, broadcasters again, because they want to see certain things. Um, so, yeah, that, that's where I'm at with all those things. Mm. So when I, when I look at the New South Wales origin side in particular, they've now lost Nathan Cleary. Mm. Huge part of their side. Massive they may have lost Happy Coruscant as well, hot off the press. Hot off the press. So you've now got a side that's potentially lost their nine and their seven. Now, if you were in a club team, you wouldn't change too much about your attack. You'd have a replacement come in. You'd start again. You just keep going as you're going. You don't throw the throw everything out because you've trained on these sorts of things for six plus months easily, mm. um, at least five months before you kick a football and play a game. Mm-hmm. In the Origin Arena, however, you've done a week and a half and done a few things, but now you are forced into certain changes. Do you change your style of attack around these new players coming in? Do you change how you want to play football to suit certain players that are coming in? Or do you try and chug along the same lines that you had before and the plans that you had before those players left the team? Great great question. And it's not always a one-size-fits-all model. So if we look at New South Wales in particular, Mm. Cleary and Luai have both been part of successful origins and successful premiership pushes for Penrith. Mm. However, <clears throat> on the origin circuit, the last couple of years haven't been very successful. Right? <clears throat> Pardon me. So from an origin-only perspective, you could argue that a time for change might be necessary because it isn't working. Mm. You could argue that Queensland are starting to pick the behaviour of the New South Wales attack because they know the Penrith blueprint so well. I mean, you've got you've even got Api Corasau in there from the last game, who's ex Penrith, Luai, Cleary, and Yo. Mm. The only part of the spine that's different is James Tedesco, but he could fit in at fullback in anybody's team. Mm. So you could argue that that has been to their detriment. Now, the continuation you can have in an Origin series is if you've had a successful year the year before. Like Billy Slater, he can carry over a lot of the themes from last year into this year, mm. and you're not necessarily reteaching them. But when it starts to go wrong, as it has a little bit with New South Wales, you've either got a stick or twist. And ultimately, rep football is a balance between the best team or the best individuals. Mm. <clears throat> I am not. 100% convinced that the best players in rugby league can't adapt whoever is inside or outside them. I don't think there's that many cases in origin history of catastrophic combinations, mm. especially when you've got 10 days to work something out. They are representative players for a reason, and that one of those reasons is that they tend to be able to adapt to things really quickly adapt Mm. to things really quickly. So in terms of, I think your question was sort of related to whether New South Wales should chuck the baby, the the toys out of the bathwater kind of thing. And Mm. um, I don't just think they should throw the toys out. I think they should throw the baby out as well. Yeah. Okay. I think they've got to try something else because I think they're on the brink of two nil. Mm. and losing a second series in succession. And Freddie could be looking for a new employer because a lot of energy went into Brad Fittler being where he is because he came through the system. A lot of energy also went into the players that got there Mm. um, through the system. And if they lose this series, they 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 failed in in their key task uh, three times in the last four, I think it is. Mm. So that's yes. not good. That's not good. So I think he's got, you know, you've got, you got to know when to hold him and when to fold him. Mm. And I think he's got to fold him because he's got to try something or else it'll be gone. Okay. What, that, what that is, sorry, mate, what that You're is right. and what it looks like, I'm yet to be 100% convinced. But again, having somebody like Nico Hines in the squad, you've got to use him. Mm. 
So I, I'm going to ask you this question with that in mind. There are several candidates out there for the job of six and seven for the New South Wales team. Mm -hmm. You've just indicated that you would throw out the game plan, completely re-overhaul for game two. Who are now your origin halves, and does that have an effect on the rest of your team? Well, first of all, I didn't say I'd overhaul <coughs> the game plan. I said I'd overhaul of personnel. Oh, that's what I meant anyway. Mm, okay. You can if you if you apply the same game plan with different personnel. So you can't tell me that Nicole Hine. Sorry, you can't tell me that if Cameron Munster and Jerome Luai were playing in the same game plan. So if Cameron Munster for some reason had a blue shirt on, mm. you can't tell me that he couldn't carry out the same game plan that they've been using in the past. But the, on the on the other side of it, he also wouldn't make it look different because he's Cameron Munster, mm. right? Um, I think a lot of the things come from, a lot of the problems come from the readability of Isaiah Yo when he passes the football. I think he slows things down too much. And I think, I think his place is, is as, as important as the halfback discussion. I have lent a little bit towards Reynolds. Reynolds isn't as old as Dally Cherry Evans. Mm. He's not as old as Alfie Langer when he got dropped back in. Brisbane's his home ground. They'll only hate on Adam Reynolds so much that some corp, I think. And he's a quality footballer. Mm. Listening to Gus on the Six Tackles with Gus podcast that nobody listens to because they all listen to us, obviously. Mm. He suggests Moses because Moses is more of a prototype similar to Cleary. I don't agree with Moses because Moses hasn't proven yet that he can ice the big, big, big games. Mm. And in the one origin game he did play, I'm pretty convinced they lost that game from memory. Mm, yes. So um, that isn't a goer for me. You've also got Nico Hines there who was privy to the system in the last game. Can he not slot, slot straight in? I would lean towards myself, Adam Reynolds, in that discussion. Yeah. But Nico doesn't miss out for mine. I think... You've now lost the partnership with Cleary and Luai. Therefore, Luai is in some serious danger, in my opinion. Why the obsession with partnerships and combinations? I don't um, have. I didn't have one to start with. Yeah, but, but there is there is no, no, and and it's in the media a lot, isn't it? It is. I think there's a stronger argument for Cody Walker than Jerome Luai if you put Reynolds in the seven. I also think that Nico Hines needs to have an opportunity to do what he can. And I think he'd be really suited to that 5-8 role. I really do believe that he's got an outstanding running game. He well, provides you, you just said on one hand, you're not bringing in combinations and then put together a combination. What, what do you, you mean? Start with Walker and Reynolds. So well, if I you pick Reynolds, you have to put <coughs> Walker in. You don't have to. I'm saying okay. if they went down the avenue of combinations, if that's what they like, yeah, yeah, yeah. the combination of, of Luai and Cleary is now gone. I don't believe Luai is the best 5-8. In, the, in New South Wales, and I believe that he he got that position. He's very, very good, don't get me wrong, but really because of that that connection with Yo and Cleary. I think they're probably more the stronger suits than Luai was in that team. I think Luai is still a very, very good footballer. I just don't believe he's the best. I st I'm very much believe Cody Walker's the best 5'8 in New South Wales, um, and I think Nico Hines would be if he was playing 5-8 regularly. There's another thing that has to come into this, mate, and that's which ones of them will be left standing. Mm. Because one thing I didn't mention in my players are doing too much uh, pontification is that I'm, I constantly bang on about there being a mid-season mid international break and origin thrown in there. Mm. A lot of media types have put it at the end of the season. A lot of responses to me on social media say end of the season. I'm not a fan of that, um, particularly because four players are going to be out. Sorry, some players will be out for four weeks because their team didn't make the finals. Um, and I think we can't... The year and now of a player backing up three days after origin, four days after origin, this isn't the 1990s anymore. Mm. It's not even the 2000s. 
it's a brutal, brutal game now where the injury tolls before Origin are horrendous and now they are really horrendous. Mm. So Freddie's hand could get forced here and it might be a blessing to him. But let's look who's fit now. Hines, Walker, Luai. Reynolds. Cook, Reynolds, Cook mm. at hooker. So now if Cook is the next best option, mm. if they think in combination, do they go Walker, Reynolds? And yes, they probably have to change the game plan. So the question is, how good is this game plan that New South Wales are employing? Is it obvious that the, the New South Wales game plan is the same as Penrith? I'm not sure it is at all. But what is obvious is that those who are from the Penrith uh, club do have similar patterns to when they do play for Penrith together as well. So, um, you know... And their position dictates they touch the ball up. Yeah. Joey Johns played Origin a lot. Matty Johns didn't play alongside him that much. Mm-hmm even though they were a very instinctive combination for Newcastle. So that probably gives you some indication as to how how players can adapt to what's around them. As an elite coach, Lee, you, you've put together representative camps yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, and you, you've been the head of those programs and you've had to sit down and think about it. For people at home that are very privy to the combinations argument, saying that there's not enough time with the 10 days, let's say... Lee Addison's now the head coach and the master organiser behind a 10-day camp and you've got a spine that doesn't know each other. Talk us through some of the tactics that these coaches use to familiarise those players with each other before they even get to the park because I've been in a few of these camps. They don't just have the the, the eight or so training sessions, do they? Well, first of all, First of all, I will say that if I was coaching New South Wales, it would be 2-1 New South Wales at the end of this series. So (laughs) just putting it out there. Um, and that's if you're put in today. Yeah. The <laughs> how do they introduce them? Mm. Well, I've never been in an origin camp with them, but I know how I introduce them. And that's and that's what I'm asking. I'm not asking. No, I'm, no, I'm depend, especially if it was ten days away. I'd send them to the pub. Okay. I'd send a load of them to the pub um, to break some barriers. Um, secondly, we make the assumption that they probably do know each other anyway. I mean, players are that sort of. Um, pally with each other now. They're either pally or they're dead set enemies. There's another way of looking at it: room choices as well. You can put some of them in the same room, but that that is if you're away. You know, if you if you're at home, you might keep them at home. You know. Mm. Um, I actually think in terms of gameplay, we also make two big assumptions in the media and in general about how much coaching actually goes into these things you end up stripping the game right back. It's the players that bring their genius to these things, and that's what mm. comes out. I mean, do you think somebody like Joey Johns really needed much structure around him to conduct yeah. a, or JT? Mm. Um, Nathan Cleary could probably dictate somewhat the, the structure. And I guess that comes down again to the combination. Maybe Cleary said, I want Luai around me or whatnot. So, but yeah, I don't think I don't think there's a hell of a lot of coaching. So I actually think it's really easy because you, you shave a lot off when you're coaching rep. You know mm. some things aren't going to be perfect. What you do is you are uh, comfortable being uncomfortable. One of the best ways I've seen somebody bring somebody together, apart from getting them on the gypsy's kiss, was Matthew Elliott when we were in America. He literally just said, what are you smiling at? I've never heard that, the gypsy's kiss. Oh, <laughs> got me that. The, uh, <laughs> the, um, he basically said to the players, it's not an option. You are now brothers. Mm. And these are players from the other side of the world from each other mm. who didn't know each other, didn't know if they play, could play or couldn't. I'd say that's a harder sell than uh, somebody coming from another NRL pl- club who you really respect as a player, mm. you know? Um, so Matthew Elliott just said, you're all brothers, it's not an option. Nothing else will be tolerated. Right. Treat. Really just took out the old, just disarmed the whole, oh, who's he, who's he? Just not your old brothers now, by the way. Yeah. 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 And he worded right. it better than I just did then, but yeah, it worked. And I remember it like it was yesterday. Yeah. Okay. Nice. Now, now another one that you've brought up and it, it, it really made me think in my head, you, you've been talking about an international window with State of Origins here. 
so people understand what effect would that have on the competition on the preseason? And if they're playing that much football, how do you, how do you mold your preseason to change the injuries we're getting now? Because I'm of the belief that a lot of their overtraining and overstimulation could be happening in those earlier months. Are you? Do you agree? Yeah, I think. I think we're just careering towards a real horrible, horrible outcome for a player. Mm. So there's one thing having a broken jaw and a torn this and a torn that. And God forbid, I don't want it to happen again, but, you know, we have seen on a rugby league field in the last decade a player put in a wheelchair for the rest of his life. Mm. So the game has the ability to, for that to happen. Yes. I f- back then when that happened, nobody said, oh, it's because of the amount of training or this, that, and the other. Yeah. If they do it now, and then another one happens, God forbid, I'm touching wood constantly here. You know, if something really, really bad happens, I, mm. I feel we're careering towards that. Yeah. I really do. And it might take something like that for everyone to say, right, that's enough. Because if you're a coach now or borrowed time, like if you're Justin Holbrook at the start of this season, for example, knowing that your job was under pressure, you wouldn't do less with your players. Yeah. But I think what might need to be be put down is the NRL might need to put mandatory training times down. Um, Facilities in place and, and resources in place so that players can... Well, first of all, this would have to come from the players, but they can dob in their their club if they're going overtime and stuff like yeah. that. Um, they need to do something like that because the the NFL have things like that for for collision training and whatnot. Do they? So I, th- I think yeah, and I think we also need something along those lines for. I think you're allowed two full contact train training in the NFL preseason. That's it. Yeah. In the whole preseason. Correct. Wow. So we need something like that, I think. Mm. And I don't know. I, you know, everyone goes, oh, it's just a game, you know, blah, blah, blah. No, it's human beings that are getting, you know, Happy Carousel tonight is going home tonight and he might not be able to eat food properly for a while, whether he's broken his jaw or not. He's got a sore jaw. Mm. There was a lot of soft tissue injuries the weekend after Origin. Yes. So it's clearly commensurate with what we're doing. You know, happy Coruscant, I didn't see the incident, but if you're a bit mentally tired and physically tired, you can put your head in the wrong place. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. It's a split session, second decision, putting your head in the right mm-hmm. position. It really is. It's split second. You make a decision, you go for it. And, and that's why seasoned NRL veterans get it wrong because yeah. there's a lot of fatigue involved. Yep. All right, Lee. Well, that's uh, that pretty much sums up some of my quick fire questions I had for you. That's um, all right. Just I don't mind just having a shorter one, mate. It's fine. Well, um, if you've not that, got much else. You've had a busy week. I have had a busy week, um, but I thought I would quick fire you a few things about Origin because I am interested about how they're going to play this the New South Welshman. Um, we don't have to wait too long to find out, do we? Um, not mention Queensland. Well, they're laughing, aren't they? Didn't Jay Arrow get injured? Jay Arrow got injured. Um, and Tom Gilbert. Oh, um, how long is Gilbert out for? Gilbert's gone. He's looking at shoulder surgery, um, which happened during Origin. Yeah. Um, and then Joy Arrow. Um, yeah, I believe he's going to be out as well. And mm. look, it, it. Apologies. It does depend heavily on what happens this weekend. Um, at this stage, Queenslanders have no notable injuries. Um, New South Wales obviously losing a hook or a half. They really do have, I'd say, the more injuries. Um, Tom Trubowicz has been ruled okay to play. Latrell Mitchell, let's hope he plays as well for the Blues. Um, But, yeah, I think it really could be catastrophic for them. I think it could. They were always going to be facing an uphill battle uh, at Suncorp, but this could be hard. Depending on who they pick, Lee, I still, I in my head, I have New South Wales winning this game and squaring it up at Suncorp. I really do. You said that two weeks ago, to be fair to you. I did. I did. I, I just think that I think it'll be a really tight game. I think New South Wales will edge them out. You know, Freddie has a real dodgy record in the first game. Really? 
throughout his career in the in the Origin Arena. Yeah, yeah I, I think know. he's only won one opening game or something like that. Probably the only quick thing I didn't touch on is is Freddie, as we have mentioned, may be in a bit of trouble with the loss mm-hmm. in Origin too. Mm-hmm. Um, if he loses the series this year, certainly back to back losses, he'll definitely be in trouble. If he loses, if he wins at Suncorp and loses, then regardless, there'll be questions, and no doubt some form of internal review, which. Sorry. I suppose they do that every year, don't they? They would have a, an internal review post-origin. Um, but my question is, you picked up Freddie Fittler, and when Billy Slater was appointed last year, you said Freddie Fittler didn't come out of nowhere. He was through the system. He coached the 18s, the yeah. 20s, and all yeah, those sorts yeah, of yeah, things. Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, the majority of those concepts have now left and gone. There's a Queensland under-19s. There's no Queensland uh, under-19s women's. There's no Queensland under 20s males. Is there not? There's not. There's no Queensland under 18 males. There's schoolboys. That's it. Okay. My question to you is where do they find the new Freddie? Is there someone ready made coming through the system? I don't know if if there is. I don't know if there is. I don't believe there is either. And then where do we go from here? I don't know if there is. And um, the, the big focus I've got on the origin positions is that both of them are Channel 9 commentators. Because if you think about Billy Slater, I think he came out of left field. Mm. I don't think any, you know, I don't think Billy Slater was in a system for Queensland, was he? Or was he in the academy system or something? Um, but I, my, my thought is that Billy Slater's first ever game as a head coach was Origin 1, 2022. Mm. Yeah, I believe it was too. I don't have um, any any evidence. So, so evidence to that end, we could have anyone. Mm. And if it has to be a Channel Nine commentator, well, Peter Saltus, Joey, Matt, yeah, Matt Thompson, yeah, Dan, Dan Ganae, yeah, it's uh, Ruan Sims, Ruan Sims, yeah, Gustang. Do you reckon the Gus comes back? You never know. Well. Uh, do you, do you think there is a conversation there with Channel Nine and, and you know Channel Nine own the game effectively? They, they they own some of it with news, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Of course. I mean, look at the access that they have to those two coaches on Origin and the dressing rooms. Mm. That should be every game, really. Yeah, you like that. You like that, don't you? You really like that access. Well, what I like is our game getting bigger, and and people seeing things that they don't see in every other sport. Mm. And I think some of the coverage you can get from a dressing room at certain times or a coach's uh, thoughts in the middle of a game or his uh, gesticulations in the coaching box. They're pure, raw, emotional things that make people get attached to a sport. So, you know, we're a sport that's desperate to get more eyeballs and supporters, so we need to do more. Mm. Not cut people off. You see, we have a bit of a culture where some of our players and some of our coaches say, no, no, that's enough. I'm not doing interviews today and all this. They should be signing every autograph they can, doing every interview they can and giving press access to whatever they can because we're a game that has to grow. We're not there yet. We can't copy what Premier League managers and players do or pop stars or Hollywood actors or Super Bowl uh, NFL players. We're trying to get there. Mm. So we have to work harder. And um, and that's why I like the concept of what happens in, in origin, because that's how it should be. Mm. And we can probably do even more. Do you have any suggestions? Well, I know that in the past we've had a, a camera. Have we not had a camera on the ref's head or something like that? Or Yeah, we have. We have yeah. had a camera on the um, head. We've had camera on the crossbar. We've had a spider across. Um, mm. What else could you have? Why can't we hear some of the team talk? Right. As in half time. Pre match, half time. Why do you not? not do you not think the coaches would want to keep that internal? Well, they get paid enough. I'm sure they can think of something to say that doesn't give too much away for the 30 seconds the camera's on them. Mm. Okay. Some of the coaches in the NRL are paid astronomical amounts. They are. They are. They're definitely 500000 to a $1 million uh, coaches. Yeah. So, you know, if somebody's getting paid that much, then I'm sure they can, for 30 seconds, just Make- pretend to, to say a lot without saying anything. Mm. Make up a couple of code words. 
you know, and there's, there's a few things you can say that are just like comments around hustle, team hustle. Come on, lads, let's go. You know, whatever it is. Mm. You don't have to say, you know, you can negotiate with the coaches and say, look, we're going to be coming in at this time. Can you just put something, can you just say something that... Yeah, it'd be good for them to have sort of almost like a light above them on the camera so they know when it's yeah. on. Yeah. You know, the players, it might just be the players. Like, oh, head coach Lee Addison isn't saying very much, but Captain Taylor Brown was very vocal there. Mm. Um, if, there's gone, if there's a language worry, they just put it on a slight delay. Well, it's already on a six-second delay. It's on a six-second delay, but also you could pre-record the footage and show it. You know, mm. so um, yeah. you can put it on a two-minute delay if you want. So, and you've seen um, how that works—the old, you know, interview yeah, yeah. first and delay. Yeah. You've seen that firsthand. Yep. Yeah. So, um, I have no doubt coaches have changed their behaviour since they've had cameras in the corner of the dressing room, which they seem to have at all games. I mean, mm. Des wasn't really thinking about it when he took the door off at Para that time, but um, uh, you know, I think they've changed the behaviour. Like a lot of them like to sit down in a circle with the players and all this and put on a bit of a show bit of an act mm. well, I don't know about there's this. one man who doesn't do that it's called Wayne Bennett and he's won more more premierships than a lot of them yeah I don't do the old sitting down in a circle sort of mm. thing um, you know he's always been the boss the coach so he's you know if he's above you he's above you that's how it goes mm -hmm. just like I always think you say sir to the ref even if you say you're well, joking, sir. Co the coach probably <laughs> wants to stand up. The coach probably wants to stand up because he's been sat on his his ass for 40 minutes. Mm. Whereas the players have been running around, they want to sit down. I mean, why do we need to analyze it? Really? It's yeah. It's uh and, and there's some players that are walking around behind, there's some players that are on bikes. It's you know, mm -hmm. you need to do your best to perform. Why can't the coach? I absolutely mm -hmm. agree. You know, one thing as well, my halftime talks, and you remember this, they don't last long at all, do they? No. No. You need to do this, you need to do this, you need to do this. Somebody else has something. Yeah, I agree with you. Right. Yeah, let's go. Yeah. Mm. Mm. There's a, and all in all, I, I found my experience of half times. there's not too much actual team or like coach talking to, to the players. Mm. There's a few key points. Mm. Usually the coach will come around and say one thing to each player mm. if they have something, you know? Yeah. Um, but it depends how you communicate with them. Like one of the reasons that my halftime team talks weren't much or aren't much is because over the years, I've got better with just giving the information that's needed. Number two, I communicate with my players constantly throughout the game, mm. through with through my trainers and whatnot. So, crap yeah, on. yeah, absolutely. Um, all right, Lee, we might all wrap right, it up there. I do want to just have a quick little shout out um, to Special Ops Socials before we continue. Mm. Special Ops Socials are the chief sponsor of Rugby League Coach Podcast. Mm -hmm. um, on a personal note, they're doing a fantastic job for myself at TV Media. Um, and it's it's really increased. Uh, well, I'd say tenfold, but that'd be underselling it. It's it's <laughs> almost a hundred, two hundred fold at this stage. It's uh it's astronomical. So, uh, big shout out to Special Ops Socials um, for getting behind us at rugbyleaguecoach.com.au and Rugby League Coach Podcast, and as well personally at TB Media. So, yep, awesome. That sounds good. Thanks, Lee. We'll uh, catch take up care. Next Catch up next week on the Rugby League Coach podcast. Um, but until then, we'll go to Around the Town with Taylor Brown.